Good morning, friends. Welcome to Explorers Forum for Sunday, February 7. We are continuing the six-week series led by Sue Linderman on racism in America, the history we didn't learn in school, with the fifth installment, Voter Suppression, Then and Now. Let's open with prayer, please. Loving and merciful God, we come to you this morning grateful for the chance to be together once again. We ask that you open our ears, our minds, and our hearts as we encounter the harsh reality of these topics, which are difficult, perplexing, and enlightening. Help us remember that, in the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Be with us, guide us, comfort us, and inspire us as we continue to grapple with these issues and strive to right the injustices in our country's history. We ask these things in the name of your precious Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So please join me in welcoming back Sue Linderman to continue our series. Well, thank you. It's so good to be with you again this morning uh, to share this time as we explore racism in America, the history we didn't learn in school. As Margaret Ann said, this is section number five of six, voter suppression, then and now. As we've traced the chronological history of our country from its founding through the civil rights movement in the mid 19th century, we've seen glimpses of concerted efforts to suppress the voting rights and the power of non-white people. Today, we will focus explicitly on the right to vote as a foundation of our democracy and the extraordinary efforts that have been expended and are intensifying to this day to prevent these citizens from achieving meaningful representation. As a brief recap from last week, we focused on mass incarceration and the war on drugs recognizing uh, four major legislative policies that were enacted over that time period that resulted in part in significant law enforcement incentives to prosecute drug crimes and the corollary effect of the militarization of our state and local police departments in contrast to their stated mission to protect and serve. We know in terms of mass incarceration that the United States leads the world. We are 5% of the world's population and have 25% of the world's prisoners. All of this has had a disproportionate impact on people of color. And today our criminal justice system is racialized at every stage. So we move today to voter suppression. And we'll begin with a historical framework of our country's voting rights, the path to representation for African Americans following the Civil War, then the adaptive tactics of the white majority for nearly 100 years to prevent African Americans from voting, culminating in the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which once again spurred a major backlash. Emory University professor Carol Anderson has written a book called White Rage, where she postulates that African American progress is always met with white backlash. And certainly when it comes to voting rights in our country, that has been supremely true. So our historical framework, we begin with the Declaration of Independence, where Thomas Jefferson declared that governments are instituted among men and men, uh, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. So the just power to govern comes from the consent of the people being governed. And, and we have the ability to give that consent through our vote. The United States Constitution contains a section that speaks to voting and it's only one, it's Article One, Section Four, Clause One. And it says the times, places, and manner of holding elections for senators and representatives shall be prescribed in each state by the legislature thereof. But Congress may at any time make or alter such regulations, except as to the place of choosing senators. So that's it. That's the only mention of voting in the Constitution. 
But when we move to constitutional amendments, once we get beyond the first 10 amendments, which constitute the Bill of Rights, we find that almost a third of the subsequent amendments deal with some aspect of voting. The 14th Amendment grants citizenship to a former slaves, which should confer the right to vote, but it didn't. And so the 15th Amendment was passed to declare that citizens of all races have the right to vote. That was passed, ratified in 1870. In 1920, women were granted the right to vote, um, a slippery slide for sure. The 23rd Amendment in 1961 granted the residents of the District of Columbia the right to vote for president and vice president. They are not, of course, represented in the Senate. In 1964, the 24th Amendment outlawed the poll tax, which had been used to disenfranchise poor people across the country. And then the 26th Amendment was passed in 1971 um, in association uh, with a reaction to the Vietnam War that reduced the voting age in elections from 21 to 18. Now it's really interesting um, because when the first election was held after George Washington's presidencies in, the, in 1820, when landed white men were allowed to vote there were 108,000 ballots cast out of a population of almost 10 million. So you could see how constricted the right to vote was at that particular point in time. Now we talked about the fact that citizens were granted the right to vote, citizens of all races by the 15th amendment, but Native Americans were not granted citizenship until the Snyder Act of 1924 was passed. And so, although they were here first, they did not become citizens until 1924. And even then, states typically largely restricted the rights of Native Americans to vote. And so, um, all of this was in place until the next significant event, which was the Voting Rights Act of 1965. At the time that that Voting Rights Act was passed, only four of 13 Southern states had black population registered in excess of 50%. So all of the actions that were taken in the intervening time period had a significant effect on disenfranchising African-Americans. <clears throat> so at the end of the Civil War, the path to enfranchisement began. We know the 13th Amendment freed the slaves, sort of. Then citizenship and due process granted by the 14th Amendment in 1868 and the right to vote in 1870. And at that point in time, over a half a million black men registered to vote. And so we had the hope of representation at last. And the adaptive tactics began. Violence as voter suppression was endemic, particularly throughout the South. The Ku Klux Klan was founded in 1865 and other um, corollary organizations were formed to carry out violence as well. We had an opportunity to see a video of the occurrence of lynchings and racial violence during the period of time that the federal troops were present in the South. And during that time period, there were 34 documented mass lynchings that occurred during that period. And many of those were focused explicitly on voter suppression. So in 1866 in New Orleans, 33 blacks were lynched. In 1868, a significant event occurred in Opelousas, uh, Louisiana, where 200 Blacks were killed attempting to vote. Utah, Alabama, although it was only four people, um, was a significant event. At the point of the um, 1870 election, 1,200 
black citizens voted in 1876, following this violent event, only 10 black citizens voted. After the Appaloosas violence, zero black citizens voted. And so these occasions of mass violence accomplished what they set out to do, which was to keep African-Americans away from the polls. We're familiar with the 1876 election. There was um, significant brutal targeting of African-American citizens prior to the 1876 election that resulted in a significant reduction in the number of people willing to risk their lives in order to vote. And we know that that election did not produce a clear winner between Samuel Tilden and Rutherford B. Hayes. And so the compromise of 1877 made Rutherford B. Hayes the president if he would withdraw the troops and bring reconstruction to an end. And so he did. We spent a little bit of time on an earlier class on the Mississippi plan that was developed as the result of a constitutional convention called in 1890 whose stated purpose was to completely disenfranchise the black population of Mississippi. And subsequently, every single other state implemented the Mississippi plan. It introduced the idea of the grandfather clause. The grandfather clause said that if your grandfather had been entitled to vote before 1865, then you could register to vote which of course meant that no African-Americans could register under that circumstance. A poll tax was implemented that made it very difficult for poorer members of society, whites and blacks, to be able to register to vote. And the literacy test was a significant obstacle. By 1940, more than half of African Americans in the South had less than a five-year education and 12% had none. When the Mississippi plan and the Louisiana constitution were written, they were explicitly written with um, convoluted portions of the constitution that had to be read and interpreted by prospective voters in order to be able to register. And so the impact of the grandfather clause, the poll tax, the literacy test meant that whereas uh, black reg voter registration in 1868 was at 90%, by 1892, that number had dropped to 6%. And so the Louisiana constitution even further um, disenfranchised all black voters with the stated intention of reasserting white supremacy in the state. By 1910, no Southern blacks were able to vote. There were efforts at that point in time to register more black voters and there was some success in making that happen. And so another um, approach was taken to disadvantage African-American voters. And that was by creating something called the white primary. So the Democratic Party in many states adopted a rule that excluded blacks from party membership. And then they limited primaries only to party members. There was actually a Supreme Court case that was decided in 1921 when that ruling was challenged. And the Supreme Court ruled that political parties were private organizations and not part of the government election apparatus. And as a consequence, if the parties chose to exclude blacks from membership, that was okay. And so, Given one party rule in the Southern states, whoever was nominated in the white primary was the de facto uh, elected representative and were blacks were excluded from participating in that part of the process. So finally, in 1944, yet another Supreme Court decision, Smith v. Allwright, overruled that decision 
and struck down the white primary as a violation of the 15th Amendment. So Texas Democrats decided that they would have pre-primary elections where only white citizens could vote. And so the pre-primary elections selected the candidate for the primary election where blacks were allowed to vote, but of course the candidate had already been selected without their participation. And it was not until 1944 that these white primaries were finally outlawed. The adaptive tactics continued. This is a, an image from the editorial page of the Miami Herald in 1940, just to make sure that the message is clear. There are also continuing lynchings and brutal attacks on people as they tried to vote, um, as they tried to participate in political meetings and the political process. Another aspect of attempting to prevent black voting or sharecropper evictions. And Terry Dykstra talked a little bit about this uh, at our last class. So many uh, black families in the South were employed as sharecroppers. They lived on white lands. They uh, got loans from white landowners. Um, and their ability to manage their own economic livelihood was significantly constrained. And for most of these people, uh, they had nowhere to go other than the sharecropping farms where they lived. So in 1960, uh, 1,400 African Americans registered to vote in Fayette County, Tennessee, and 700 of them were evicted from their sharecropper farms. White landowners in Greene County, Alabama evicted at least 75 black families in 1960. And more than 40 black families were evicted in Lowndes County, Alabama in 1965, December 1965 alone. These evictions were part of a systematic plan to thwart civil rights activists and prevent black people from voting. Black men and women who registered to vote were required to provide the names of their employers who could then be notified. Newspapers printed the names of black people who attempted to register and white citizens councils distributed voter lists to white merchants who denied basic necessities and employment to African-Americans who registered or tried to register to vote. Many of these evicted families were forced to live in tent cities that sprang up throughout the South. And so regardless of weather conditions, um, entire families sheltered in fabric tents that froze in the winter, had no running water and one outhouse for dozens of people. White segregationist night riders terrorized the camps, firing guns into the tent cities in the middle of the night. And so the SNCC field secretary, George Green, observed, it's a very frightening thing to have to accept the cold reality that in order to exercise their rights to get what they could get in this great democracy in America here in 1966, people were living in tents. And so in every way imaginable, resistance to enforcement of the 15th Amendment continued. And Congress ultimately came to the realization that existing uh, federal anti-discrimination laws were insufficient to overcome the resistance by state officials to enforcing the 15th Amendment and the right to vote. And so the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was passed by Congress. It has been called the single most significant piece of civil rights legislation ever passed by Congress. There were three key sections. Section two was basically a restatement of the 15th Amendment. Section four identified jurisdictions where um, there was a significant history of racial discrimination. And that formula described and defined the states, counties, and municipalities whose past behavior had meant 
that black citizens were significantly disenfranchised. And section five specified that these targeted areas could not make any fundamental changes to their voting rules without pre-clearance from the Department of Justice. When that act was passed in 1965, it uh, contained a clause that it needed to be um, uh, re renewed every five years. And so in 1970, it was renewed for five years. In 1975, uh, section four was updated to define those uh, jurisdictions that were most um, vehement in opposition to the Voting Rights Act and the 15th Amendment. And that year, the, uh, the Voting Rights Act was renewed for seven years. Then in 1982, when Congress took a look at it, uh, it was renewed for 25 years. So it next came up for renewal in 2006. And the vote was 393 to 10 to renew it for another 25 years and it was unanimously approved in the Senate. Imagine, a unanimous approval in the Senate. But a Supreme Court case was filed by Shelby County, Alabama, Shelby County v. Eric Holder, and a decision reached by the Supreme Court in 2013 that struck down Section 4. Within eight hours, Texas implemented a previously blocked voter ID law that had been uh, declared um, not constitutional under the preclearance section. North Carolina immediately reduced its early voting locations from 16 to one. Alabama closed the DMV offices in eight of the 10 counties where the black population was more than 75%. Between 1982 and 2006, there had been 700 discriminatory voting changes blocked by the Department of Justice. And now that provision, that possibility was gone. And so the aftermath was enormous in terms of the negative effect on African-American voting rights um, across the country not just in the South. So the current assault, particularly after the Shelby County beholder decision, a lot of it is predicated on the myth of voter fraud. Um, a constitutional law scholar, Justin Levitt, um, professor at Loyola University, took a leave of absence to the Justice Department of Justice in 2015. And he embarked on a study of general, special um, state and local elections between 2000 and 2014. And he looked at 1 billion votes and identified 36 credible cases of possible voter fraud. Not proven, no charges, but 36 out of a billion. And interestingly, in 2006, which was when the last time the um, Voting Rights Act was reauthorized, prior to 2006, you did not need an ID to vote in any state in the country. But starting in 2006, these voter ID laws began to be passed again in backlash, in opposition, in reflection of the reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act. So just a few examples. Um, in Alabama, Alabama issues a photo ID to every resident of public housing. Uh, public housing residents, 71% uh, are African-American. Every one of those public housing residents has a government issued voter ID, which is not sufficient as an ID to vote. In Georgia, they eliminated 12 types of IDs and substituted six types of government issued photo IDs, many of which African-American citizens did not have. 
In Indiana, there had not been a single instance of voter fraud in the state's history. So they passed a law that um, you have to have a, a birth certificate in order to get a state ID or a driver's license. But in Marion County, which is home to 200,000 African-American citizens, you have to have a driver's license to get a copy of your birth certificate. North Carolina, the legislature commissioned a study to say, what types of voter IDs are white people most apt to have? What type are black people most to have, most likely to have? And then they passed a law that said that the only acceptable voter IDs were that group of IDs that white voters were most likely to have. When a case was taken to court, the judge who blocked that law, uh, the Fourth Circuit, ruled that the law was targeted at African Americans with, quote, almost surgical precision. In North Dakota, there was a decision in October of 2010 that voter IDs require a street address. But Native Americans who live on reservations don't have street addresses. They only have post office boxes. And so their IDs don't qualify. In Texas, you have to have a DMV issued voter ID, but a third of the counties don't have a DMV. And in some cases, it's a 250 mile round trip to get to the closest Department of Motor Vehicles. And in Texas, if you have a concealed carry permit, that counts as a legitimate voter ID, but your student photo ID, does not. At the same time, significant effort was going into purging voter rolls. The National Voting Registration Act was, was enacted in part to deal with this because it says that you cannot be purged from a voter registration roll just because you haven't voted recently. But that is exactly what is being done. And the cross-check program was developed in Kansas and it ultimately spread to 28 states where um, matching is done of voter registration rolls across states. And uh, the match is sought on the basis of first and last name and date of birth. In the case of Iowa, they used that cross-check program and they received a notice that 240,000 of their residents had been paired with someone in another state, indicating that potentially those nearly quarter of a million people were voting in two states. But when they did the further research, they found that there were six cases where it was the same person. And in all six cases, the person had moved from one state to the other. Arizona, purged 271,000 voters based on cross-check in 2016. In 2017, Florida purged 182,000. Georgia purged almost three quarters of a million between 2012 and 2014 for failure to vote. And then another 600,000 were purged in 2017. Indiana purged a half a million. Michigan purged 450,000. North Carolina purged 600,000, all on the basis of this cross-check program. And Ohio purged 2 million voters between 2011 and 16, 1.2 million of them for voting infrequently. The assault continues. Discrimination against minority precincts. We know that there are reduced early voting sites, reduced voting sites, limited numbers of early voting dates, and uh, limited resources being provided to minority precincts. In Florida, the limited early voting pre uh, polling stations meant not, uh, four to five hour wait times. We know this now, but back in 2008 and 2010, 2006, this was new. Uh, Indiana, any county with more than 325,000 
citizens could only have one early voting site unless there was unanimous bipartisan election board agreement, and there wasn't. In Ohio, one polling station per county, regardless of the population. And Florida was an instructive case in 2000. Um, in 2000, election officials discovered that 16% of registered voters in Florida were black, up from 10% in the previous election. And so they devised a laptop program that could be used to let local election officials decide whether someone was indeed registered and qualified to vote when they showed up at the polling place. It linked into the master database in Tallahassee so that if you showed up and for some reason you weren't on the roll, somebody could type your information into the laptop and you would get an instantaneous answer as to whether you were in fact allowed to vote. Um, those laptops were distributed to all predominantly white precincts in Florida, uh, but only to one predominantly black precinct in the state. And so in all the other locations, if you showed up and weren't listed on the rolls, an election official at the polling place had to try to reach someone in Tallahassee by phone to determine whether or not you were eligible to vote. And needless to say, a disproportionate share of black voters were um, either, either ended up leaving uh, or were told that they could cast a provisional ballot, which would be counted later. Even further, you remember those uh, hanging chads and the punch card systems in 2000? A disproportionate share of those were utilized in majority black precincts. The whiter counties had the more modern optical scanners and lower rates of uncounted ballots. And intimidation continued. Republican ballot integrity programs um, have long been familiar in the white South. And so at this period of time, Republican agents, sometimes aided by local police, warned blacks seeking to vote that even innocent technical errors in their registration information, such as a wrong address, could subject them to arrest. Blacks seeking to vote were often photographed with the implication that they could be arrested later. Felon voting rights are yet another aspect of the assault. In two states in the country, Maine and Vermont, felons never lose their right to vote. They can vote from prison. In 14 states in the District of Columbia, you lose your right to vote while you're incarcerated, but that right is automatically restored upon your release from jail. 21 states, you lose your right to vote during incarceration and typically during parole and probation, but your right to vote is automatically restored at the end of that time period. Now we know from our previous class that there have been significant extensions in the amounts of time that those formerly incarcerated are on probation are parole or parole. And so that also clearly impacts their ability to vote. And 13 states, your right to vote is indefinitely uh, lost. It requires a governor's pardon, a personal individual governor's pardon for you to be able to vote. And then there's an additional waiting period after the governor issues the pardon. Florida passed a referendum recently, last year, um, that allowed felon voting rights to be restored. But then the legislature passed a bill that said all fines and fees would have to be paid in full before you would be able to vote. And they challenged all of the election sites to guarantee that any former felon had completely paid their fines and fees before being allowed to vote without granting them any access to that information to know whether or not that repayment had been accomplished. 
Gerrymandering is a significant issue when it comes to people's representation, even if you're able to vote. In 1972, a law was enacted that said that districts uh, needed, uh, that, that states needed to carry out redistricting every 10 years. Before that, it wasn't necessary. And the, the, the nature and the, um, the outline of some of these election districts are quite extraordinary as states have sought to ensure in essence that some votes count more than others. So um, in a recent Wisconsin election, Democrats um, won 52% of the votes that resulted in uh, holding 39% of the seats. In North Carolina, Republicans gained 50% of the votes and 77% of the seats in the legislature. And so a couple of things happen with regard to all of this. One is the degree to which we are giving uh, our consent to being governed in terms of our representation, but we're also seeing this significantly increased number of safe seats where often there is no opponent. And so um, the nature of the composition of the electorate means that whichever candidate the party uh, nominates will become the de facto representative in Congress. And of course, I first began teaching this um, in 2018. Um, clearly, the elections last fall demonstrate uh, the continuing intensity of assault on, uh, on voting rights. In fact, the Brennan Center for Justice has reported that uh, since January 1st, 21, 28 states have introduced 106 bills to further restrict uh, the rights uh, to vote, further um, strengthen voter ID laws, uh, further uh, made it more difficult for citizens, particularly certain categories of citizens living in certain parts of the states to be able to vote and to have their voices heard. So we've seen much of uh, our country's history in these weeks together that cry out for action and reform. Much of the historic economic discrimination will take decades or longer to repair, to address in comprehensive ways. But we have it within our ability to take meaningful action on issues of criminal justice reform and voting rights reform. It's essential that we do so that we make our voices heard so that other voices can be heard as well. Here are some of the initiatives that could make a difference. Automatic voter registration, although that is being overturned in many states. Establish independent districting commissions so that it is not the party in power that controls the redistricting every 10 years. Make election day a national holiday if July 4th can be a national holiday, what's more American than election day? Enforce the National Voting Rights Act, assure passage of the John R. Lewis Voting Rights Act, the new bill passed by the House of Representatives last year, in essence, to recreate, to uh, reinstate the Voting Rights Act of 1965, addressing the issues that the Supreme Court found. And then of course, personal advocacy in every aspect of our interactions. Thank you, Sue. Um, I know that as I was pondering this particular topic today, of course, last fall's events uh, were at the forefront. So um, I'm glad that, that we sort of ended with that. We're gonna move to our time of questions and I see a hand from the Hansons. Thank you. Um, and Sue, again, thank you so much, uh, as always, for your, your care and your, um, and your presentation. This week, I had the opportunity to speak with the, um, with the incoming head of the 
ACLU's um, Smart Justice Initiative here in Delaware, um, Hanif Salam. And Hanif has been part of the Achievement Center, um, uh, which tries works for reentry. And I had been asked to contact him or suggested that I contact him. And he understands some of the work that we're trying to do in the presbytery. Um, he has, uh, uh, frankly, um, an immediate need um, for folks who are white. <laughs> he was very specific about this for white folks to um, take a look at the recommendations um, of the Smart Justice Initiative and the Black uh, Delaware Black Caucus on, um, among other things, uh, both criminal justice and voting reform, and um, to consider very strongly uh, uh, being willing to lobby in Dover. Um, and again, it may be at this point, it may be a virtual lobby in Dover, but um, he has been told by the Black Caucus that white allies right now are incredibly important to getting their initiative passed. He, um, and he's, uh, he's a formerly justice involved individual himself, um, a really great guy. He's, I, I have really nothing but positive things to say about him. He also has other programs, but for today's purposes, I told him that um, I had this really wonderful opportunity to get to, to say to all of you, if anyone is interested in this, if you want to lobby right now to see if you can make change in Delaware, I can get you connected with Hanif um, and with the, the Smart Justice um, Alliance. Um, I think it's Alliance. Um, and I'm happy to do so. Uh, I want to see if we can spread this to other people in, um, in the Presbyterian hood because the one thing we've got is a lot of um, interested white people. Um, <laughs> Sorry, it's who we are, uh, who many of us are, I should say. So, uh, and, and he was unabashed in that way that I said, how can we be allies? And he said, right now, this is the, one of the best ways you could possibly be an ally. And I think it, um, I certainly didn't think that that was just coincidence. I thought it, it was something I would bring to all of you. So um, there you are. Sorry, I didn't sure. have a question. It was more of a public service announcement. The, uh, the education in the background is to inform action, uh, and we don't need to wait for the end of the class to act. So thank you. That's great. Any other questions or comments for Sue this morning? There is a chat. Uh, it says, in my opinion, disenfranchisement of people of color doesn't happen as easily if that person is your neighbor across the street. Substantial change as a culture will happen when our neighborhoods, schools, and businesses are places that empower people of color, and that means intentional organizational reparations by white folks. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, thank you, Margaret Ann. Uh, uh, I wanted to know from Shannon, how do we get in touch with Henny through ACLU and Smart Justice, or how do we get in touch Sarah with- Lincoln. Is there a link or how do we do that? He's actually starting his work at the ACLU tomorrow. So I don't have a, an email address or link to give you today. Um, so if you are interested, I, I have his personal email address, but by tomorrow he will have, I presume you can go on to the ACLU. I will ask him specifically um, how to do that. Um, and he apologized, he just doesn't have the ACLU email yet. Because right. he's can, just started. I can One wait five days, that's fine. Um, Westminster's Peace and Justice Work Group is a member of the Coalition for Smart Justice. Um, and I can send you, um, I don't know who I might send it to, um, their current request for action. Um, in, in lobbying in this regard, if that would happen. Shannon, let me send that to you. Okay, yes. I'll do that. Um, they've been quite clear, and I think we've talked about it here before. One of the virtues or advantages of Delaware being a small state is that um, not many people talk directly to our representatives. And so when a significant number of people do talk, uh, they pay attention. And a significant number here is not in the thousands. It's typically in the hundreds that, that can really make a difference in lobbying our representatives. 
Anyone else have any questions or comments before we move on? Shannon or John? Yeah, you know, as, as history teachers, we're always, we're pressed for time. And I think that we have this, um, this pattern of uh, going through the Civil War, maybe touching upon Reconstruction a little bit, and then in terms of um, African Americans jumping to the civil rights movement, and you know the, the idea of, of you know voter registration dropping to I think you said six percent at one time that um, that sort of late eighteen hundreds up through you know the the nineteen tens twenties thirties and forties is, is such a sad history. Uh, that, that I think people just don't get exposed to. And, and that, John, was my experience at the start of this, you know, Civil War, Little Reconstruction, those darn carpetbaggers. And then I lived through the Civil Rights Movement and that wasn't a history class, that was, that was real life. Um, but really not much of anything in the interim and certainly not as it had to do with African-Americans in the United States. So it's, it's a huge gap and um, it, has, it has, has had and continues to have such powerful impacts on every aspect of our country and our life, regardless of what race we are, what age we are, what socioeconomic circumstance we are. The, the reverberations are extraordinary. Thank you. Mine is mostly a comment. I've uh, been a member of League of Women Voters for a number of years, and one of the one of the uh, volunteer jobs I liked to do so much was registering voters at voting fairs or, or uh, community fairs and that kind of thing. And I'm realizing just, over, especially having watched these laws over the last five, ten years since the Supreme Court struck that down, how draco draconian they've been. You know, we were, we were really fortunate here in Delaware, we could take a driver's license. If they didn't have a driver's license, well, just tell me your address. I'll write it down and, and Department of Elections will double check you and you're in. And um, if you don't have a street address, draw. there's a little place on this form to draw a little map and put an X where you live on, at this intersection. Um, so it's just kind of horrifying me, to me to see all these other regulations piled on and piled on and piled on. So much energy going into suppressing the vote when it could be used for such a good purpose other ways, other times. So it's just frustration. Thank you. And Connie, I, to that point, you know, I think there's a fundamental question. What should the role of government be when it comes to voting? Should it be to facilitate voting or to constrain it? I mean, mm. go back to the Declaration of Independence. Why are we here? What are we doing? What, what gives legitimacy to the government? What's the role of government in, in facilitating or constraining voting? I think the answer is clear, but it certainly isn't what's happening. The other thing I've noticed is now there's there are a lot of uh, attempts in this new and probably past legislation, recent legislation that will not allow volunteer groups to to oh. register individuals anymore in really? some states. In some states, I've forgotten. Okay. Maybe it's Texas right now pending, or it may be in some of this new legislation that's pending. Um, I'd be willing to bet it's in Georgia. I I can't remember where I saw it, but I. I, it made an, uh, made an impression on me. We have a number of hands, Jesse, Judy, Sue and Bill, Lyle, uh, and then Noble. Uh, I wanted to first um, thank Sue before next week because uh, hey, this has been beyond educational. I, I you know, uh, we haven't had much black history uh, in the school system that I was in and uh, you have really just given me an education. I'm not sure I really want it at this time because it's been, uh, not, it hasn't been a feel good thing, but it's been very painful, but uh, very, very helpful to me. Um, and I, I really appreciate uh, what you're doing. It, it's 
really been a blessing. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. And oops, there is some, you know, we want to look at ways that the voter suppression can be challenged and looking at Georgia and what Stacey Abrams and her organization did, what pe the Poor People's Campaign and other groups, I mean, I, I know my hand was tired from writing postcards and I know other people did and we got the vote out and look what happened. There were two Democratic senators elected. So we have to look at that as an example of ways that we can overcome some of the suppression and use that as motivation for doing more. And Georgia is one of those states that has now enacted or has brought up three new bills um, to um, eliminate no fault, absentee voting, uh, you know, to undo so much of the work that was done in anticipation of the 2020 election. So the, the battle continues. Lyle. Thank you, Sue, for all that you have put forward, especially current matters. My issue has for years been, how do I get a handle on whatever I can get a handle on for what little bit I can do before I die? And I'm very grateful for the listing of how voter suppression is happening now. I hear about it on the news, but I don't have the specifics. So, except occasionally. So my desire next week is to write those things down and then see that we do them here in Delaware, where I obviously live, and then get a handle on it so I can communicate to my, my daughter in Wisconsin so I can communicate to my family in other parts of the country, some of whom will be wanting voter suppression, but most of whom will be, uh, will be uh, saying that's wrong. It's wrong to suppress the vote, let people have their vote. Most of my family will support that. So uh, this is a way I can get a handle on something. And because changing the culture, I've desired to change the culture all my life. I've preached about it, talked about it, done everything I can to influence the Presbyterians in the pew and the churches in which I served. However, does that impact the culture? We are what percent of the population of the country? If you add us all up, all at 1.7 million of us in the 19, uh, 2000 or 2010 statistic, uh, voter, when we still ask for denominational identification, I don't know if that still happens. And even with all of that, we are extremely small portion, uh, just as Presbyterians. Now, mainstream Protestants, we get a little better off there, and uh, but it's still a mixed bag because everybody in the pew didn't go with me. All right. So the culture is really tough, tough to change. However, if we keep hanging in there, bit by bit, doing what we can get our hands on, I believe we'll make a difference. And I trust God to eventually change the culture like what happened with the death of George Floyd. We have a huge momentum. Now where it's going to go, God only knows, but I keep praying. That's, that's my comment. Thank you, Sue, for bringing this up and uh, giving us some way to grab hold. Thank you. Thank you, Lyle. Noble, we'll have our last comment for this morning. <clears throat> Thank you, Sue. It's, um, it's uncommon for me not to have anything to say and to be lost for words, but I'm kind of lost for words. I went to Lincoln University, which is a historical black university in Southern Chester County, Pennsylvania, just above the Maryland state line. And during the sixties, we registered Black voters, I tried to register Black voters, and the KKK was right there, Rising Sun, and we encountered them, and we continue to work. And over the years, we've, we as individuals, all of us here have tried to work. And past four years, I have seen things going back, backwards, and I, I, I just find that I'm perpetually angry now. I'm a different person. I'm just angry. And I'm always on the precipice of hate. I mean, I see these perpetrations performed by supposedly good Christian people. I've said this before. And yet the evil persists. As Lyle says, we try, 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 and we can't change the culture. 
I find it very, very difficult not to become discouraged. And I am typically a very positive person. My life as a young black kid coming from Chester and becoming a board certified neuroradiologist testifies that there's something in this world that is good beyond my doing alone. Um, but right now, I'm feeling very, very tired. I'm very, very weary. I'm so angry of everything I see in the press. I'm so tired of seeing people standing up and, 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 and castigating uh, the minority of people. And I just don't know how I can deal with the anger that I feel, uh, how I can overcome this feeling. I'm trying, I'm trying. But right now I'm feeling really at a low. And I think allowing for that kind of ebb and flow of feeling is really important and acknowledging it. Um, there's, there's always hope, it's just hard to see at times. And, and I think sometimes I get mad at myself for being so angry and so discouraged. And I'm going to bed at two or three o'clock in the afternoon, you know, it's just like I can't watch one more news event. Um, but there is always tomorrow. Uh, and I think working in concert with other people who see the possibilities. Um, there is power in numbers. There is the opportunity to take a deep breath and try one more time, but you gotta be ready for it. And, and, and I think we need to allow ourselves the time to rest mm -hmm. from time to time when it's just hard. Thank you. That's uh, actually a great little segue into two comments that I did wanna share that showed up in the chat. Um, both from Pastor Sam. The most recent was, rage is a good source of energy. Don't the rest of us feel it? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a great lead into next week's topic. And the, the other one that I wanted to share that he, he so, so eloquently stated was, in America, the right to vote has always been tied to the right to free religion and socioeconomic power. Don't solve the latter in particular we are at the whims of the majority party. Voting is not democracy, shared power that voting incarnates is democracy. Mm -hmm. so, thank you, Sam, for sharing those. Mm -hmm. And thank you, Sue, and to everyone else who is with us this morning. Next week, Sue Getman will host the final installment in this series entitled, Where Do We Go From Here? We do hope that you will join us as the series concludes and it has been stated many times this morning, the real work begins. Okay. Thank you for being with us. This Thank morning. you all. Enjoy.